can't kill us. We ready to get it on? In Left 4 Dead 2, we wanted to give players who were looking for a narrative a little more. To do this, we introduce the four survivors to each other and the infection as we begin the game. This lets us see the world changing through their eyes, and the world is changing. Each new campaign shows a different stage in reaction to the infection. We start with Sita's naive underwhelming response and end with the military's cold but needed resolve to save only those they can. We also connect each campaign. So while you know you escape Whispering Oaks and Dark Carnival, you also know that it's just one escape of many on your journey to safety in New Orleans. Time does pass between campaigns, but each campaign starts with the previous rescue vehicle. We also continue to spread hints and clues to the infection. There is more story in the dialogue this time around, but players should still search for and read graffiti and notes in the world. Observant players of Left 4 Dead will notice some tie-ins to the story as both games are set in the same world. Yeah! Hey, we should get going, man. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. Bow bomb here. Bomb yourself. The new special infected were designed with a variety of goals in mind. They needed to fill in gaps left by the other specials. They needed to provide interesting combos with other infected. And they needed to offer a new, fun set of skills for players to master, whether they were playing as or against the infected. When we began Left 4 Dead 2, we had a list of several dozen infected types that have been discussed over the past several years. We added a fair number of new designs to those, and eventually whittled our list down to the final three. The Charger, the Spitter, and the Jockey. The best survivor teams stick close together and buckle down under attack, quickly fending off infected attacks. To provide an opening for the infected to capitalize upon, we created the Charger. His charge attack not only separates members from the group, but will bowl down tightly clumped survivors, giving a few crucial moments for the other infected to attack. The only non-boss infected who is immune to being bashed, his design encourages players to keep a quick trigger finger and a watchful eye on their companions, while also keeping their distance. The Spitter's area of denial attack serves a variety of purposes. While the initial pool of acid permits a few moments for escape, its damage increases as the acid begins to do its work. Lingering in or passing through the pool of acid is a dangerous proposition, and it can quickly force a group of survivors out of a tight spot, or drive a wedge between members of a group. The Jockey is the one special that retains control after he's begun his incapacitating attack. He's also the only special that allows a survivor to maintain enough control to fight back. A well-played Jockey has many ways of driving a survivor to a deadly end, either at the hands of other infected, or through the environment itself. Just getting a survivor far enough out of the group for another special to prey upon is often the jockey's greatest strength. All of these special types provide unique opportunities for combined attacks alongside the classic hunter, smoker, and boomer. Grab the first aid. No, I don't need it. Hurry up! I got your back. Yeah, Let's boy, go. I got your back. The park started out having several paths that were dynamically changed for added replayability. However, playtesters found the paths confusing. When we removed the dynamic objects that forced survivors to go in certain directions, we found that having all paths open led to a better experience. Players still spend a lot of time in the park, but they could choose to go different ways every time they played the level. You reckon we should move out now? I'm with you. I'm with you. Got your back. What the hell? These things fireproof? Got some chest oh, yeah. <laughs> With the added variety of weapons in Left 4 Dead 2, we wanted to encourage players to scavenge weapons and switch between them frequently. We found that placing ammo piles scattered through the level fought against this goal, as players tended to find one gun they liked and then never switch, as long as they had practically endless ammo. We experimented with removing ammo piles from most of the environments, so that the only way to get more ammo was to find a new gun, and we immediately saw players switching weapon types more frequently. 
Reloading. We also experimented with giving players deployable ammo packs, similar to the upgrade packs, such as the incendiary and explosive ammo that are in the game today. Carrying an ammo pack was perceived as being less valuable than carrying a health kit, though, and many players bypassed the item, counting on finding another gun along the way. We found it was important, however, to continue to place ammo piles in the finale areas, to give players a home base to fight from in the longer set-piece battles. Let's roll. We take well, I'll be go. damned. Fireproof zombies. Reload! I'm a snipe. Shoot the armored zombies in the back! Watch out! Reloading! I'm a reload! Their backs ain't bulletproof. The animators experimented quite a bit with the movement styles of the new special infected in order to help them contrast with the existing specials. Some early passes at the spitter featured awkward, bouncy, bird-like movements with knock knees and pigeon toes. She certainly looked different, but it was a little too humorous and didn't project enough of a feeling of strength and danger. So she ended up with much more aggressive posing and actions. We tried a few animal-inspired runs for the jockey, including sideways leaping hops like a lemur and a four-legged hyena-like gallop. These fit with his maniacal laughter, but again, needed to be more aggressive. Such movements also would have caused problems maneuvering the character and reading its intentions in-game, especially in versus mode. They also seemed too much of a mutation from the character's original human state when considering the amount of time from the start of his infection. The jockey's final movement pass has him on two legs with just the right touch of animal inspiration. A menacing, predatory hunch, and hands bent rather like a praying mantis, ready to give survivors a big, deadly hug. Here, you can have this. Thanks. Oh, shit, that ain't right! First aid kit here. Here you go now. You'll probably put this to better use than me. Oh, yeah. Don't you reckon we should move on now? I'm here. We Why should go not? that there way. In Left 4 Dead 1, long narrow hallways usually meant relative safety for survivors. One player could cover the front, and another could cover the rear, while players in the middle healed. With the addition of the charger, however, the long and narrow hallways in Left 4 Dead 2 turn out to be extremely dangerous. Bullshit! The two overpasses in this area continue throughout the rest of the campaign and eventually meet up with the bridge that the survivors must cross to escape. When we initially designed the campaign, we planned for these overpasses to guide players to their eventual goal. The alarm scenario at the bus station was the first Left 4 Dead 2 Crescendo event to feature the gauntlet mode, where players must navigate along a path to deactivate the zombie rush. This proved to be a successful approach to countering the camping strategy of finding an optimal corner and holding out. Hurry it, hurry it! Ain't that a load of shit! I'm here. I got you. Let's go. Let's go, let's go. 
I'm here. Hey, hey don't oh stop God. running! Hey, get up there! Turn it off! Ah! Yo, who's your Get daddy? Alarm. Left 4 Dead 1 had a good, fictionally justifiable cast of guns, the M16 being a standard police and military weapon, for example. In Left 4 Dead 2, we had the opportunity to do something a bit less generic and use some more interesting guns, while still being aware that we had to justify their place in the game. The Desert Rifle, for example, is used to suggest that the military had rerouted guns meant for the Middle East back to deal with the domestic crisis, hence the desert camouflage scheme on the gun. The ever popular AK-47, which is actually part AK-74, is so plentiful that it's easy to justify its appearance almost anywhere, whereas the silenced SMG is more of an underground criminal looking weapon, so it's interesting to think how this has found its way into the survivor's hands. The hunting rifle from Left 4 Dead 1 is back, and we've added a military sniper rifle which is double the clip size and is more of a scoped semi-automatic assault rifle, rather than the classic bolt-action sniper rifle which would be ineffective against the Horde. Left 4 Dead 2 also features a variety of pistols, including a custom civilian handgun, a standard issue police sidearm, and a large caliber magnum. Run, 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 run! shit. Run! Because Left 4 Dead 1 took place entirely during the night, it was fairly straightforward to light the path we wanted players to take. For campaigns that take place during the day, we had to find other tools to help the player along. The most valuable tools were visible landmarks, such as gas station signs, overpasses, the bridge, and smoke from wrecked aircraft. Turn off the alarm! Man, don't stop running! That's right, you can't kill us. We gotta turn off the alarm! Oh, ho, ho. <laughs> I got it! As with our efforts to replace the first aid kit, replacing the pain pills item was a challenge. Initial versions of Adrenaline allowed players to run faster and perform certain actions faster, such as reviving other players. But the pills already give 50 temporary health points, which is enough health for injured players to run at full speed again, so the Adrenaline needed something extra. We expanded the actions that could be affected by Adrenaline, shortening the time it takes to use health kits, defibrillators, and upgrade packs. We sped up the player beyond their normal maximum speed and made them resistant to being slowed down by hits from the infected. Although it doesn't give as much health as the pain pills, we found many interesting strategies began to emerge from the well-timed use of adrenaline. Weapons over here. Oh shit! Come on, keep move on. I'm with you. Why not? I'm with you. All right. As we added more special infected characters to Left 4 Dead 2, we faced a challenge in designing unique sounds for them that players could easily recognize and distinguish from the other specials and from the common infected. In Left 4 Dead, the four male specials each had both a distinct tonal range and a character attribute to keep them unique. For instance, the boomer's vocalizations were kind of a slow, deep, bassy, gastric horror. As we added the new specials into the mix, it became increasingly difficult to avoid impinging on the sonic space of the previous specials. We found that we couldn't rely so much on using the tonal range for distinction, and instead had to push harder on characterization to help them to read clearly to players. For example, the jockey is in the high, bright, tonal range of the smoker, and even the upper end of the hunter. But since the infection has left his brain in a constant state of hysterical mania, his vocalizations read clearly apart from these other specials. Sometimes it can be challenging to find a characterization that will lend itself to both a special's active and idle or lurking modes. For instance, with the Charger, we started out with a non-verbal angry muttering, kind of a griping bark that we all liked. Though the personality in his idle states was interesting and distinct, we found that we needed to ramp his vocalizations up to a more sustained yell for his attacks to get the right sonic intensity for these events. In subsequent playtests, however, we found that players were often surprised when attacked by the Charger as they would associate him only with the aggressive attack vocalizations he makes from the point that he sees them through his charge, and since he would generally see players before they saw him, they didn't have a chance to connect him with the angry, non-verbal mutterings of his idle states. 
So we ended up recording new vocalizations for these states, mixing in elements of his more strident calls and yells amid the gripes and barks of his idle states, so that players could more readily make the leap to recognizing a lurking charger in the vicinity. Let's go. I'm right behind. I'm with hey, you. Let me tell you something. Let's go. Y'all the best. Jockey. The Source Engine's animation system is a powerful tool that lets us create animations procedurally Jockey. instead of authoring each of them individually by hand. There are various reasons for doing this, which become clear when we consider the challenge of animating the jockey riding a survivor. From the start of the jockey's design, we wanted the survivor to be able to fight back to some degree. With that in mind, we decided it would be vital for the survivor to know the jockey's intent, regardless of how successful he was at acting on it. So even though you may be stuck against the table going nowhere with a jockey on your back, we want you to understand that the jockey is really trying to get you out that door at the end of the room, and around a corner where your friends can't help you. To accomplish this, we implemented a system of animation layers for the survivor that would work in conjunction with the jockey. These layers are attached to different controls that the code interacts with, called pose parameters. The first layer consists of the survivor's upper body from the waist up, which allows the survivor's reactions to work in sync with the jockey's motion. The second layer is the survivor's locomotion, constrained to the lower half of his body from the waist down. So, in the scenario we just described, when the jockey is in full control and has a clear path to the door, the code tells the upper body of the survivor and the body of the jockey to lean in that direction, and sets a post parameter for the survivor's legs to move along that vector as well. However, things get more interesting when the survivor regains some control and steers himself to get stuck on the table. Even though you have stopped moving towards the door, we don't want the jockey's animation to suddenly sit straight up and give the impression he isn't still trying to steer you there. By splitting the survivor's animation into two different animation layers that we composite together, your upper body and the jockey can remain leaning towards the door, while the code tells the legs to stop walking because you're stuck on the table and can't advance. This robust system of procedurally compositing upper and lower body animation layers and position in real time, as we've shown in this case, saved us a lot of authoring time as well as memory inside the game, both of which are finite and very valuable on any project. Hey, I got a bio bomb here. We kill zombies. That is what we do. What? Get inside! Hey man, we should keep going. We tight. Sure thing, let's go. Oh hell!